Okay, hello everybody. I hope you can hear me all. Um, uh, sorry for the delay in starting, but um, uh, we've had, I have to say, we've had our problems. Um, uh, just hold on a moment, folks. And uh, anyway, it's our very great privilege to welcome once again Jeff Rainer Canem, who gave oh, us a fantastic go. talk about working with the Inuit last November. In fact, while we've been waiting to start his meeting, he's been telling me about um, he travels in the north, and believe me, that was quite hair raising, but we're not, that's not the subject today. Uh, the subject today, rather, is Harriet Brook. As, as Jeff puts it, a long-forgotten pioneering woman nuclear scientist. But in some ways, in fact, this is much a story, I, I, I hope Jeff doesn't mind me saying this, in some respects, this is as much a story about the vein of Canaan as Harriet Brooke, because it was just finding out, but there was virtually nothing available about Harriet Brooke, but started the vein of Canaan, both Jeff and Marlene, started them on their long trek to find out about woman chemists, which of course it had such a profound effect in all of us. And I'm wondering where Jeff has gone to. Jeff, are you there? Yes, okay. Well, oh, thank sorry, you. I, 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 <laughs> Jeff, yeah, thank before yeah. we have any more problems, can you just start telling us a bit about yourself while I continue to admit people in? So here we are, folks. Okay. Jeff Lena okay. I'm talking about how you book. Oh, okay, thanks very much. Yes, the, this story goes back a very long way. And, and one of the points that we, we forget about when we're, write, when we're doing history of chemistry or even chemistry itself is we, we don't give the background like social scientists do. Um, I remember <laughs> years ago uh, working with iridium compounds and producing these lovely crystals and getting them uh, a crystal structure done and there's no iridium in, but it was a compound never... Uh, studied since Berzelius, but when I put put it in the article saying this was by accident, the editor ex excised that. You're not supposed to say that. You're supposed to, as, as if I was an organic chemist and I'd, I'd all planned this stuff. So uh, getting to this particular story, that uh, we, we never say how and the why, and I think this is very important. And so this is the story of how we actually came across Harriet Brooks' life and work and how it's, it's developed a, a life of its own since then. And uh, unfortunately, Marlene... Where uh, Memorial University is, huh? Yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry, I should mention that. Uh, I'm at the Grenfell Campus of Memorial University in, in, in Cornwall, Newfoundland. It's on the... Newfoundland. The west, yeah, west coast of Newfoundland. Uh, mm -hmm. a con a continuation of the Appalachians. So it's it's got lots of fjords and mount it's uh, very mountainous and in fact the uh, um, the the trail the Appalachian Trail goes up through there. So mm -hmm. and it's a small campus about a thousand two hundred yeah about a thousand two hundred students. So okay, so I get into the the story. So uh, all of you are familiar with Marie Curie and. Uh, uh, Irene Curie, and also with Lise Meitner, but for most people, this is the uh, end of their knowledge of women involved in, in radioactivity. So it was, as far as we recall, about 1985 that I was reading the book, Discovery of the Chemical Elements by Weeks and Lester. And in the pages, there was this cameo portrait. And uh, I said to Marilyn, that uh, I've, I've never come across her and never seen anything about her. And if you, you know what it says from Miss Brooks researches and his own rather da da da. I said, who on earth is she? So I said to Mali, we'll, we'll work for the summer on this. And this turned out to be, this is 1985. This turned out to be about a 20 year research project. So we started and we found the pictures. 40 years. <laughs> We found obituaries in McGill University archives, and they referred to uh, Barnard College. So we contacted oh Rutherford. So we went uh, we Rutherford. went to Rutherford's archives and found some letters between her and Rutherford. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we 
it, she, it was mentioned that she was at Barnard College in one of the letters. So we then contacted Barnard College and there were letters uh, pertaining to her in the Barnard College archives. Um, then we found there was a letter in the Curie archives in Paris. So it, this is getting more and more mysterious. I mean, she was just, not just uh, working one place, she seemed to be all over the place. And we then found there's material in Gorky Museum in Moscow. And we managed to get in touch with a surviving son, Paul Brooks Pitcher, and he said, would we like to see a note case? And we said, well, yes, please. So he sent that to us and there were various letters, some photographs, and one of the photographs was of uh, Maxim Gorky. Mm -hmm. So this be be started becoming very convoluted. And then he said, to, said uh, he, he, he uh, uh, contacted us, would we be interested in seeing the love letters that uh, his father wrote to, to his mother? And we said, oh, that'd be, uh, give us an insight. And uh, we got these and he put them in the regular mail. It really, we, 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 we thought this, this should have gone, you know, priority, courier, whatever. Anyway, so this is what got us started. And, and it was really like a true detective story, putting all these pieces together, trying to figure out where she was, what where she went to, and so on. So this is the, the account of, of her life that we put together from all these bits and pieces. And, it, and, and some of the pieces were quite serendipitous. We were at, uh, doing a sabbatical at the University of California at Santa Cruz, and uh, we found uh, a mention of her in a Russian publication. Unfortunately, it was a Russian speaker on the student who who did the translations for us. We also found some mentions in a in an Italian newspaper of the Gorky and his party, including a Miss Brooks arriving in in Naples. It, so and there was someone there who could speak Italian. So we made and and they had the newspapers actually in their archives, and that was the pre pre all the Google stuff. So the story, so this was the story as it happened. So Harriet Brooks was born in eighteen seventy six, Exeter, Ontario, and there is Harriet there, a large family as you can see, and she went to university in. In, uh, in McGill University in Montreal. And that's a picture of the, the, the physics laboratory there. So it's quite well equipped. And uh, she did a BA honors in math and natural philosophy, which at the time was, was like phys pretty much physics. Uh, one of the things that's important in this story was that why did Rutherford come to McDonald Physics Building because the, the first part of the name to Canadian gives the answer. McDonald Tobacco in those days, the tobacco company built the uh, paid for the physics building, and this is what attracted Rutherford to Canada to to one of the outposts of the empire, not because of any love of Canada, but simply it had the the, the most up to date physics laboratories of the time, and so. Harriet Books continued on and did an MA with Ernest Rutherford. And part of this uh, was that uh, she worked on the finding out about this, this stuff from radium. Uh, it's called emanation at the time. Was it a gas? Was it a fine powder? Uh, was it uh, a vapor? And so she produced this, uh, built this apparatus uh, which still survives in the archives of, of McGill University. And you can see it really matches up. You can see the here, the, this arm that pulls out and you can see it matches this here. For, and the results they came up with uh, was that it was a gas. Now, this is where Harriet Brooks first got re written out of history. And if you look at this, Cop uh, copy of the Bulletin History of Chemistry, uh, volume 28, uh, 2003, so quite recent. And here it's titled, Ernest Rutherford, the True Discoverer of Radon. But then when you look at the original publication, The New Gas from Radium by E. Rutherford and Miss H. T. Brooks. So this is called the Matilda effect. Uh, the Matthew effect is where uh, a, a more important scientist gets all the credit and the less 
uh, important one gets written out is after the the, uh, the biblical quotation to to, to whoever hath, hath shall be given and to whoever hath not it shall be taken away and uh, it was pointed out this effect is even more uh, important when it came to women women were more often written out of the story and this became the Matilda effect after Matilda Gage a, a, a um, African-American suffragist in New York who was written out of the story so it became an all-white story of suffragists so she was really the one actually who did the lab work that showed that the emanation from radium was not uh, a powder, it was not the vapor, it was in fact a gas. And this was then uh, published in Nature, uh, being assisted by Ms. H.T. Brooks, actually she did more of the work and pointed to the conclusion, the emanation from radium, radium reality is a radioactive gas with a molecular weight probably lying between 40 and 100. She was wrong on that, but, but right in terms of it was a gas and a radioactive gas. And this truly was the first evidence of radon. Now, um, she then went off to Bryn Mawr to do a PhD. And Bryn Mawr um, was a women's college in the United States. And it, the president was very charismatic, M. Carey Thomas. And uh, I have a copy of her biography, which is huge. It runs to about 800 pages. She was an incredible, uh, powerful woman. And uh, as it says here, Bryn Mawr women would not be prepared for marriage, but for careers in which they would excel. So sometimes there were letters sent back saying, from women who, who, who bailed out and got married very apologetically that they'd not fulfilled their true destiny and so on. So while she was there, she was uh, awarded the President's European Fellowship in 1902, and she decided to take it at Cambridge with J.J. Thompson. So off she went across the Atlantic. We, we don't know whether she went straight for, from the States or whether she came back to Canada first. This is a um, a little bit missing from the story. There's a few bits missing. It's amazing we got as much as we did. So she did research with J.J. Thompson, and she was based at Newnham College, Cambridge, which in those days was out in the sheep fields so that the women wouldn't contam contaminate the men or take their mind off of the work. So that was Newnham College at the time. And she worked with J.J. Thompson, but Thompson was a very different character to, to Rutherford. He was more distant, and he really didn't believe in, in this stuff being physics. He thought it was all chemistry, and he wasn't particularly interested in it. And Brooks kept up a correspondence with Rutherford, and we, we think most of the correspondence survived. I'm afraid I'm a terrible bungler in research work. This is so extremely interesting, and I'm getting along so slowly and blunderingly with it. I think I shall have to give it up after this year. There are so many other people who can do this so much better in so much less time. I do not think my small efforts will ever be missed. And uh, this is called the imposter syndrome, which is still a major problem, particularly for, for women. Uh, scientists. And this is a good quote, I think. There can be very talented women at the top of their classes who still feel their male colleagues are much smarter. At any moment, someone's going to reveal how stupid and incompetent they really are. When, and getting back to the correspondence, that uh, the Rutherford was a magpie when it came to his correspondence. He even kept his uh, correspondence with the coal company over the claims that they delivered one sack short. Uh, unfortunately, though, uh, an archivist back, I think he was in the 1950s, uh, went through the his voluminous correspondence and removed anything, quote, that was unimportant, uh, was, was correspondence with unimportant people. So we'll never know some of the other figures, probably some of the other women scientists who who were active at the time that got thinned out. Fortunately, for some reason, the book's correspondence got left intact, as far as we know. So then she went back to McGill to continue work with Ernest Rutherford in a much more hospitable environment. 
and there's uh, Harriet Brooks, and there's Ernest Rutherford. And it was at this juncture that she, whoops, that, uh, whoop, there we go. Uh, she observed the volatility of radioactive substances, or that's what she thought at the time. This is a, a paper that was published in Nature, you notice under her own name. This is, it, perversely, this is a problem in that uh, some of the professors like Rutherford, who sometimes gave their students uh, permission to publish under their own names, meant that their work was never recognized. Uh, uh, and we've just published an article in Bulletin for the History of Chemistry on, on William Ramsey and the women that worked with him, and several of those published under their own name. And unless you read the, the footnote saying this was working with, uh, with Professor Ramsey, you wouldn't realize that they were part of the Ramsey group and, and historians wouldn't recognize their name, so they never got acknowledgement for their research. Anyway, so getting back to this, in the course of some recent experiments on excited radioactivity from the radium emanation, so this is from radon, some evidence has been obtained which points to the conclusion the emanation X of radium at one stage of the changes which it undergoes after being deposited on a so solid body is slightly volatile, even at ordinary temperatures. Now the observation was correct, but the conclusion was not. It was not to do, to do with volatility, but was to do with the atomic recoil. So uh, if you look at uh, Wikipedia, atomic recoil is, uh, was discovered by Brooks and Otto Hahn reworked it. So the, the point was that when a particle is ejected from a nucleus, that the nucleus is, uh, has a balancing uh, expulsion in the opposite direction. So some of the atoms actually expelled from the surface of the radioactive surface and it deposited on another surface. And, and this was how uh, Hahn and Meitner subsequently isolated some isotopes of other elements. They just put a, a non-radioactive piece of metal in close to the surface and some of the atoms passed over to it. And as mentioned here, the physicist Walter Gerlach described radioactive recoil as a profoundly significant discovery in physics with far-reaching consequences. The Motherford actually wrote to Hahn because Hahn claimed to have discovered it completely. And Motherford wrote, by the way, I thought I had the idea of the removal of atoms by recoil in my book, Radioactivity Somewhere, see page 392, second edition, it is given an explanation of the volatility of radium B observed by Miss Brooks. So again, Rutherford gave Brooks the credit but Hahn never did. She then went to tutor in physics at Barnard College in New York after having finished her next stint with Rutherford. This really was the, the, the most that a woman at the period could expect to get in terms of employment. And while she was there, she got engaged with Dr. Bergen Davis, and he was a strange character. Uh, he would go to lunch, and he'd have a rubber stamp made up and he'd put up, he'd stamp the, the waitress's order form with milk and cookies bring at once. So he didn't have to actually converse with them. So she got engaged and the Dean did not like this at all. The Dean of Science called for a resignation as uh, if you got engaged, you were supposed to give up your work. But Brooks wrote this stirring letter back to I think it also it is a duty I owe to my profession and to my sex to show that a woman has a right to the practice of her profession and cannot be condemned to abandon it merely because she marries. So very strong words from, from books. And she was supported by the head of physics, Margaret Maltby. And she, Margaret Maltby wrote to Dean, neither you nor I would like to give up our active professional life suddenly for domestic life. I know of no woman to take her place. No one available has the preparation and the personality and ability to teach and the skill in physical manipulation that she has. The, de the dean was unyielding. The college cannot afford to have women on the staff to whom the college work is secondary. The college is not willing to stamp with approval a woman to whom self-elected home duties can be secondary. 
So as it happened, books broke, broke off the engagement and also left Barnard. Now we're not quite sure uh, the transition, but we, she was in New York, Barnard College is in New York, and she seemed to met up with Prestonia Martin and her husband, John Martin. And uh, John Martin and Prestonia Martin ran a utopian community in Keene uh, in rural New York State. And we were very fortunate to get this because we, it, this was a house called uh, Summer Book. And we contacted the owner. Uh, this was in the 1990s, in, late in 1988, actually, 1988 and uh, said that uh, uh, this famous physicist uh, lived in your place. Do you have anything uh, at all that pertains back to that very early period? And the owner uh, contacted back and said, well, bizarrely, I do. I've got a, a picture of two women sitting by a fireplace uh, that we found in the attic. Would you be interested in it? So we, we duly visited Keene and got some more information, and particularly this photo, which shows Harriet Brooks sitting by the fireplace with Prestonia Martin. So this is one of these utopian communities, um, uh, socialist, egalitarian, so people took it in turn to do the gardening, people took it in turn to do the washing. And one of the points which I, I thought was quite amusing was that they had the old fashioned hand ringers to, to, to squish the water out of the clothes and they forgot to take the buttons off. So they squished the shirts through and these, these uh, mother of pearl buttons all got smashed to pieces and then to buy new buttons and sew them back on. They'd never thought about uh, that problem. So at the same time they were there, and this is where the link comes in, Russian link comes in, that uh, Maxim Gorky and his second wife, Maria Andreeva, uh, uh, was staying there together with his secretary, Nikolai Burenin. And it seems pretty obvious that uh, Nikolai Burenin really um, had the uh, interest in Harriet Brooks, the non-professional interest. So they were in, uh, up in this utopian community and they were there for a while, but then uh, they decided to move across the Atlantic to Italy. And there's a mention in the New York uh, uh, newspaper of Gorky and his entourage uh, leaving New York and crossing the Atlantic. And in Harriet Books's note case, one of the pictures was this one. And this is the ship, according to New York Times, uh, the Princess Irene. And there's Harriet Brooks and Andreeva and Maxim Gorky. And uh, uh, Andreeva wanted to go back and see her son in Russia, and she was persona non grata. So the, the Brooks uh, family history was that uh, uh, Brooks lent Andreeva her passport, because in those days they didn't have a picture. Uh, Andreeva used Harriet Brooks' uh, passport to get back into Russia and out again safely. There were several pictures of them on the island of Capri, and uh, here's one of them, and there's Harriet Brooks, and uh, there's Maxim Gorky over there. And in the Gorky archives, this is a photo of Harriet Brooks, and it was uh, uh, gifted uh, from Berenin. And uh, this is a so that's where the, this photograph came from. And, and the Gorky archives were, were quite uh, fascinated to find out who, the, who this Harriet Brooks was in, in the Gorky archives. Now she stayed there a while, and, but she, she then resurfaced in uh, Paris with at the Institute de Radium. And uh, uh, she worked with, uh, Marie Curie and wrote about it in, in a letter. Uh, she didn't have any publications. And one of the myth myths is that uh, uh, Curie was always on the own. And certainly it was in the early years, there was, there was just her and her husband and uh, one other working together. But in the later years, there was a positively large number of women working with her in the, in the Institute to Radium. And this is a, a recent book, which, uh, 
talks about all the women of the Curie Laboratory, including Brooks. So she was over there and uh, Rutherford got in touch with her and invited her to go back to work at the University of Manchester. She found uh, Curie very cold, distant, and this wasn't the sort of environment she was happy working in. And, and uh, so she, the plans were that she was going to go back to Manchester. And Rutherford was really keen because, as come, will come up later, that he, he regarded her as the best worker in, in, uh, in uh, radioactivity next to Marie Curie. He was very keen to get her back in his research group again. However, this was not to be. He sent a letter to Arthur Schuster, the head of physics at Manchester. Miss Brooks has just informed me she's engaged to be married to Mr. Pitcher of Montreal, formerly one of my demonstrators. He is an old and persistent admirer who has come over to England for the purpose of persuading her to go back with him, there to be married next month. It was a, a very uh, long courtship. He, he was um, courtship is perhaps not the right word because reading his letters, they they, they, they really express any emotion. It's more um, that uh, what do you think you can do with your life? You have little opportunity. You can become a tutor, but mate, that's as far as you're ever going to go. And uh, I'm going to provide you with a, with a nice safe marriage and a life in, in upper middle class Montreal. So, so what were the influences on Harriet Brooks? Um, she had a lack of self-confidence and, as I just mentioned, a lack of academic opportunities. There's also Mary Rutherford. She had a correspondence with Mary Rutherford and Mary Rutherford was, was pestering her to get uh, settled down and that this, this research work wasn't a suitable life for a lady. They had Prestonia Man Martin, who wrote several books on, on uh, women and, and uh, uh, utopian communities. And one thing, this, this was uh, in the area of eugenics. And she was very forceful in arguing that uh, uh, academic women, intelligent women had to, had to produce babies because otherwise that all the, the lower classes were, were breeding like rabbits. And the, the IQ of the, the Americans would be going go descend rapidly unless the, the academic women had three children to make sure that they, they were more than just the replacements. And finally, Frank Pitcher, uh, her husband to be and a former demonstrator, uh, he, he, as I said in the correspondence, was saying that she had no future uh, and that except as a tutor to for homeschooling perhaps and that she should marry him uh, before they got married he went off to continental Europe and sent a series of postcards back which survived and they, they were uh, one of them said he was in Switzerland and the waitresses in the in the hotel were really gorgeous looking I mean just the sort of thing you would send to your bride to be um and all about what a wonderful time he was having while she was back in England uh, making all the, the marriage arrangements. So indeed they got married and as per uh, Bastonia Martin, she had three children. Uh, this was the, so uh, this, the elder son, he died of spinal meningitis. Uh, the daughter, she went to McGill University and then committed suicide. Uh, and we don't know what was going through her mind, whether it's she couldn't keep up with her mother's uh, auspicious uh, uh, life. And then finally, there's Paul Brooks picture down there, who is the surviving son who we, we met a couple of times. Sorry, one time, that was in California. And uh, she died in her 50s, and it seems likely that it was radiation related. I mean, working with radon a lot, um, and, uh, and one would expect have expected her to have lived a much longer life than in her fifties. And they're all buried uh, in the the cemetery in, Mont in Montreal. So it's the husband Harriet, Barbara, Charles, Paul.
Paul, who we met. It's interesting that uh, the, the youngest one was given the, the, had books put in his name, and that was the, the wife of Paul Book's picture. So she died in 1933. So we, we put all this together and we wrote a book and um, uh, a manuscript rather, and it was duly rejected. Uh, the re reason for its rejection was that uh, it was written like a pure scientist. It had no context. It was just a series of letters, uh, articles, extract from, from, from the uh, publications. But one of the reviewers said that uh, uh, she would, uh, Marian Ainley, that she'd be willing to help us rewrite it and, uh, and make it acceptable for publication. So Marianne put together all this, these questions and stuff that we had to do. So we rewrote it totally and it was duly accepted for publication by McGill University Press. Now the twister story was that uh, uh, Marianne Ainley uh, died sadly at a, um, middle age and she left her book on on Canadian women scientists unfinished and we were asked by the family if we would take all her notes all her um, files in, on computer and try and make reorganize them and get them published and so we did so it was really nice that we were able to repay Marianne Ailey uh, by doing that and also finding a publisher for for her compilation on Canadian women scientists the Harriet Brooks book was actually translated into Japanese. Uh, and I, I, from what we can gather, that I don't know if you're familiar with Anne of Green Gables, but the Japanese regard Anne of Green Gables as, as a, a sort of iconic, and it's more Japanese in Prince Edward Island uh, than I think than anywhere else in the middle of the summer. And, uh, and so they picked up on her as like a scientific, scientific uh, Anne of Green Gables, and she's become quite iconic in, in Japanese scientific circles. We found so many other women mentioned, particularly in Rutherford's correspondence, uh, and Ellen Gleditch, um, and, uh, and so on. And we finished up researching them, and that resulted in a follow-up book called Pioneer Women of Radioactivity. And that for us, we thought, was the end of the story of radioactivity, and we then uh, returned to a subject we knew much more about, which was chemistry, and proceeded to do research on women chemists about, uh, which some of you know, and there's been a series of books ever since then. However, uh, to our amazement in the 21st century, that uh, her name has become more prominent. And uh, uh, Marlene uh, was invited to, to Ottawa, uh, and there's Robin Book's picture, the son of Paul Book's picture. And she was inducted into Canadian Canada Science and Technology Museum. So she is now a member of the, that auspicious group. And then in 2015, she was put on the cover of the Canadian Journal of Physics. And, and uh, as they discover radon, as you can see, and recognize there. If you go to a list online of the 250 greatest Canadians, she makes the list. And it was proposed when Canada came up with a new plastic $100 bill that her portrait be put on it. It never was, but someone, I've no idea who, actually uh, made a fake uh, impression and circulated online saying, it's about time we had a woman scientist uh, selected rather than all these artsy people. Maybe a future hundred dollar bill will have a picture. Then uh, the Canadian Nuclear Laboratories have had, uh, had a new building which they opened in 2016, which they called the Harriet Brooks Building. And the uh, nuclear industry has a, a Harriet Brooks Award now, and this is the uh, 2020 recipient. And here online, that uh, there's an, another uh, image of her, the first Canadian female nuclear physicist, most famous for her research on nuclear transmutations and radioactivity, Ernest Rutherford, who guided her graduate work, regarded as being next to Marie Curie in the caliber of her aptitude. And so this was the 
story of Harriet Brooks, and it launched our own work, uh, which became the centerpiece, really, of, uh, of our research for, since 1985 right through to the present day. So, so I hope you've enjoyed this story, and uh, um, I look forward to your questions. Yes, uh, thank you very much, um, Jeff, for that. Um, we um, haven't had any questions, I'm afraid, um, which shows how good the talk has been. Um, so, I mean, you've answered, you know, you made everything up here clear. Could I make a few comments? The first is that you obviously had a very complex, fascinating life, even if it ended rather sadly with her early death. So, you must have been very pleased. You must have been very pleased to um, discover all that information. And this in itself shows the fascination of research, doesn't it? Because oh, you exactly. start doing research, mm -hmm. you don't know oh, where yeah. it's going to go. And then yeah. you find it a much bigger story than you expected. And then, of course, by finding out about one person, you then find out about other people. And so it goes on and on. So I think, it, I think what your account shows is, apart from the very evidently interesting and very varied life of how your book, it also shows the fascination of doing research in history of chemistry. And I hope people watching will uh, take the point and feel emboldened to do their own research. Yeah, yeah, oh, I, I agree. And, and as I said, I think it's very important that somehow we talk about the, the, the excitement of research and going down rabbit holes and finding things and getting into utopian communities in New York State and all sorts of little avenues. Yeah, somebody wanted to ask a question, but I might put it in chat. Okay. Now, um, the other thing I was going to say is that um, you must also be incredibly pleased that um, uh, but you've had so much recognition because, I mean, if it hadn't been for all your research, I mean, we wouldn't now be even discussing the possibility of how your book being on a hundred dollar Canadian bill. So, you yeah. know, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, yeah, you yeah. chose the reward. It does show the reward of, um, yeah, oh, oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Oh, I saw a question come up, and it's a good one. Did she ever do any research after marriage? Yeah, no, yeah. she, 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 she had a, she, she gave a talk on Marie Curie, which is where the link we actually found the uh, uh, her son had a manuscript of the talk that she gave on Marie Curie to one of the women's clubs in Montreal, but she she was a, a, a devoted wife and mother. She never did anything. But Paul Brooks Pitcher always wondered why his mother had these books in Russian on, on a book on a bookshelf. Yeah, that's good. And also, um, Mary of Virginia all now had beaten me because I was just going to conclude my discussion by congratulating you and Marlene on getting this year's Hester Award at uh, my Mary of Virginia all now, your predecessor, who also spoke to us last year, yes. had already mentioned this. So, congratulations yes. to both Thank of you. Thank you. Thank you so that. much. Yeah. Um, well, somebody asked a question, but it seems to. Uh, 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 see if she asked a question. I don't know why. I don't know why she won't put it in chat. I mean, she can use chat. So. Hmm. 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 I don't allow people to ask questions them verbally. And number. Mm. 
Oh, yeah, I can't allow it to. to. Okay, another question comes through. But how did Jessica Sibbett confirm the cause of her death? Well, I think the top of layers, but they didn't really. I mean, there's been debate about even how Mary Curie died and whether that yeah. was radiation related or not. So, anyway, yeah. have you ever yeah. seen how it? Oh, oh, oh no, there was, yeah, there, there was there was no mention of radioactivity. She, uh, it was simply that she she died of um, I can't remember. I should have checked on that. Um, but there was no mention of a. Of, there was never an autopsy done. It was just that she she died of um, a blood disease or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm not using my usual computer, so it's causing me trouble. Uh, I've never had this happen. Well, Jeff, I think we have to leave it there then. And um, thank you very much for. Um, I don't know. Oh, I was just going to type in my contact information. Oh yes, you want to contact? Uh, can you put your contact details in? I've made the best way. Okay. But thank you very okay. much. Jeff. It's a wonderful talk, and it's always wonderful hearing you, particularly from the great distance across the Great Pond. Uh, and um, we'll try and think of another reason for having you back next year. Maybe okay. somebody else. Okay. Are you working on a book at the moment? Sorry? I'm working, yes. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm trying to get this to send, but it doesn't seem to want to send. Um, okay. okay. But uh, anyway, but uh, yeah. Jeff, yeah. I'll send, uh, I'll send uh, your email. Okay. Don't worry, I'll send you. Yeah. Anyway, yes, yes, we are yeah. working. On, we're working on a book for the Royal Society of Chemistry, and as, yeah. as mentioned, that there were there's some guys who were very sympathetic and who had had women working with them. And William Rams is one of them, and so this book that we're working on at the moment is where we're looking at the early twentieth, late nineteenth, early twentieth century male chemists. Um, such as uh, Augustus Vernon Harcourt, William Ramsey, who had women working with them or who really supported women's cause like for admission to the Chemical Society and, uh, and uh, then link it in with that women's lives who actually worked with them. So this is, this is a twist on the story. So this is actually about the male chemists and the women who worked with them, the British pioneering uh, one. So, and that's supposedly to be finished by the end of this year. Okay, I'm just going to go back to my other computer and try and get collect email as well. Okay, I'm on here now. I'm back on my normal computer. Yeah. Well, uh, I've just I, I've just managed to. This is my official work uh, email, so it's actually posted. I'm going, now. I'm, going to, I'm going to send Colette your email address. I can I can do it from here. I couldn't do it no. down. Oh, I I I, I sent it. So yeah, no, my official one. Just give me a moment, Jeff. I'll send yeah. you your email address. Oh yeah. Oh yes, Bragg certainly. The the two the two Braggs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just one check. Yeah. Okay. And, and it's been interesting because... Can I, I give everybody your email address and then they can contact you if they want for any further questions. Okay, well, I've, I've posted it in the chat, it, my, my work one. So you've done it, you've done it anyway. Okay. I've yeah. given you a whole mail address, but never mind, we won't, yeah. we won't do yeah. that then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, okay, anybody, if you've got any further questions, uh, have any thoughts after that? Um, Please contact Jeff. Um, Michael Dress has just suggested that Bragg might be um, somebody uh, who might be interested in 
helping women. Of course, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Very much help women, and it's going to be a subject of a meeting I'm organising in October at the Burlington House, which is the relationship, often non-platonic relationship, between um, Burnell and woman X-ray crystallography. So we're going to be exploring the, the whole topic of British crystallographers in the 20th century, and of course a lot of them were with women, and a lot of them were encouraged by Burnell. So yeah. this is a shout out for the meeting on the 18th of October. I'll be sending out details shortly. But anyway, Jeff, I'm afraid unless you want to make a trip over, you can't come to that. But <laughs> uh, that's a fitty. Uh, well, I'm sure may, maybe maybe you should uh, read the the article we wrote for the bulletin for the history of chemistry on Polly Porter, who is the one who encouraged Dorothy Hodgkin to take up uh, crystallography. Uh, I tell you what, we have a big go on Hodgkin. I'm trying to remember who it is. I think it's Judith Howard. Judith Howard is going to talk about um, Hodgkin. So I made okay. sure to use your paper. So thanks yeah. for that, Jeff. That's a good chat. Okay. Okay. Thank okay, you. Everybody. I think we're just about done. Thanks again to Jeff. Congratulations again to Jeff on his history award along with Marlene. And we yeah. look forward to seeing you next month. The history of chemistry series is now finished. So you only have one talk to come to every month. And I jolly well hope that you decide to come to it because we're so much looking forward to hearing about another woman scientist uh, next, next month. So anyway, good for now. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Yeah.